Terry, we've been talking about Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. We've talked a little bit about what was going on at Corinth, talked a little bit about how Paul is. Now we come to the first two chapters of this 16-chapter book. Help us think about two things that will be helpful to us, I think. First thing is, how does Paul start his letters? There's a kind of formula to this. And secondly, what's going on in this church that might inspire this letter? Okay. Uh, Paul begins most of his letters with a, a formal greeting, and he usually tips us off to some of his major concerns when he gives us this greeting. So uh, here in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul called to be an apostle by Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ. The issue of sanctification mm -hmm. is going to be a critical one for Paul. Uh, Call to, the, to be saints, uh, the calling of this church is going to be important for Paul. And then the second thing that he usually does at the beginning of a letter is to give a little prayer of thanks, and that begins in verse 4. And here, too, he usually continues to set the theme that he's going to be working with or lay out a couple of the issues mm -hmm. that uh, come up in his text. So I give thanks to my God always uh, for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you've been, you have been enriched in Him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. So the status and the quality of this community are very uh, important issues. Why? Because they are divisive issues. Mm. The next thing he points to in um, chapter 1, verse 10, is that there are divisions in this church. Mm -hmm. And the most obvious way in which there are divisions is that there are people who are relating to different apostles. And he says as much here in uh, verse 12, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or even I belong to Christ. These are apparently slogans that people in this congregation are using. Now, why are they latching on to different apostles? Probably because they value in different ways the gifts and graces that they have. Mm -hmm. And what these gifts and graces are uh, is going to be an issue throughout. And Paul is going to be strategizing throughout this text uh, to get them to think beyond the narrow uh, points of view or vision that they have of themselves and of their status and of their own personal yeah. relationship to God. And he's going to try to focus them on values that they share. Uh, at least that's the way no, I, I think that's read right. this text. That's is there right. anything else that's that you right. see here? In well, the, the, the thing that strikes me as you, as you say this is that Paul's inventing church as he goes along. That he doesn't have models of people who've gone out starting Gentile churches to figure out how you do these things. So he may be surprised by the fact that X years after he was there, suddenly this church which he left I assume thinking they all knew where they were and on the same page are suddenly having these odd little parties, uh, part schisms, not celebrations, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how he can bring them back to what he thinks is their central vision. It's a hugely pastoral problem. And even though I think we, I think attempts to figure out exactly what the Peter party was saying or what the Apollos party was saying are, are doomed to failure, what we do see is this very odd connection between a congregation and a particular leader and somehow an identification as if what counts is the apostle or the leader or the preacher who was most important to me. And Paul's saying that's not the central issue. That's not where we find our identity. Mm -hmm. I think that's right, but I think focusing on one of these uh, other apostles can clue us into one of the issues that's going through this text. We know a little bit about Apollos. We do know a little about we? Apollos. Uh, from, uh, from Acts. What, what do we know? We know that he's, he's known for his eloquence, and we know that he comes out of Alexandria, which is famous for its wisdom and speculation. So there's been some thought that maybe all this talk, some of this talk about the limits of wisdom, one, and two, Paul's anxiety about his own eloquence, two, comes from the fact that what he's heard from Corinth is, you should hear Apollos. Mm -hmm. He is extraordinarily eloquent, and furthermore, he's extraordinarily wise. P.S. How are you? We miss you. <laughs> yes. What a great preacher Apollos is. What a great Apollos preacher Apollos is. is, and hope it's going well for you yeah, over there at right, Ephesus, fella. Right. Something yeah. like that is going on. <laughs> now, uh, there doesn't, however, seem to be a rivalry between Paul there does and not. Apollos. Or, or if, there, if there is, Paul's downplaying it. If, 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 if they are establishing a rivalry, he's trying very hard not to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he refers to Apollos at the end, saying, sending greetings exactly, back. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So they see things in more or less in the same yeah, way, I we hope, uh, but, but there is an issue in the way being they're being perceived. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the issue of wisdom and eloquence seems yeah. to be important. Now, is, uh, how do you read Paul's eloquence here in these first couple of chapters? Uh, because I think he's uh, He's extraordinarily eloquent. Yeah. Well, 2 Corinthians picks up some of his opponents later in the story say, his letters are great, but when he shows up, he's not very good. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. um, I have a theory which I will now try on you, which has nothing to do with the rest of our conversation, and therefore we will move right on. I've always wondered whether the thorn in the flesh was some kind of speech difficulty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that what if you're a preacher, what would you most pray for that you could stop stammering, <laughs> and that that uh, he knows that's a problem and it doesn't go away and he still has it. I have no idea, but I've wondered about that. At any rate. As a, as a speaker, he sometimes thinks his eloquence is not up to Apollos. What's interesting, though, is that, that perhaps defensively, perhaps self-defensively, but nonetheless rightly, he says, that it's not the eloquence with which you preach that counts to make it gospel. It's the content of what you preach. And the content of what you preach has to do with the cross, with Jesus crucified. And we begin to get here in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 what's, what's going to be very important in a number of his letters which is that the center of good news is this crucifixion and later this resurrection event, and I'm going to help you help, ask you to help me on this, that this undercuts all the usual standards by which we judge human endeavor, including eloquence and including wisdom. Right. Paul insists on the, the ironic quality of the gospel that he's preaching. Yeah. Right. There's glory in this gospel. Yeah. Uh, there's power, but this power is revealed uh, on the utter weakness. Utter weakness. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the body of a uh, a person killed for political yeah, purposes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And somehow the, the the wisdom of God, the glory of God, the, the power of God is there. Is right there. And it we have no sense of his earlier history except he was proud of being a good Pharisee. But surely part of what must have shocked him about the Christian story was that for somebody who was so devoted to the law, the claim that God had used an outlaw executed as an outlaw, as the center of God's revelation, is scandalous, absurd, mm -hmm. and therefore foolish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another dimension here to the, um, the polemic or the edge that Paul is, uh, is honing, I think, with his rhetoric, and that's the issue of spirituality. Yeah. And apparently there's some uh, concern with this, and probably some claims to be spiritual people yeah. on the part of uh, some of these Corinthians, and it may be based on their uh, ability to interpret scripture yeah. or to uh, understand things in a more exalted way. Uh, and Paul is trying to um, suggest that there's a, a different criterion for understanding what true spirituality yeah. is all about. Yeah. And here he uses that symbol of the cross to yeah. do so. Absolutely. He'll unpack that in all sorts of interesting in ways, ways. Later, yeah. later on. Yeah. Some of it will have to do with uh, orientation to uh, other members of the community. Yeah. Some will have to do with um, the, the way in which you read scripture. Yeah. Uh, some what, will have to do with the ethical judgment yeah, you make. What does love look like? Right, and how does right. that relate to these gifts? Do you think uh, that, the, that the gifts issue and the wisdom issue come together? I mean, is, is this a kind of theological package where they say we are particularly gifted and one of our particular gifts is that we are able to discern the will of God through our own wisdom? Or are these two different issues? I think they're related. Yeah, I do too. Uh, it's a, a little difficult to tell, and sometimes Paul may be reading the situation in uh, in Corinth and importing some things yeah. into it that aren't there. But yeah. I think there probably is a connection. You know, one of the difficulties in reading a, a text like this is that we're getting one half exactly. of a two-way conversation. Exactly. Exactly. And if we had the Corinthians yeah. in front of us, they may have a slightly exactly. different take on how all exactly. of these things are hanging yeah, exactly. together. But from Paul's point of view, at least, I think there is a connection that he sees between the different problems that have been posed to him. And we also get some sense, by the way, in this uh, opening of uh, 1 Corinthians of how he's uh, getting his information. He tells yeah, us that, uh, that in verse 11 that Chloe's people have brought him some news. Chloe, a woman's name, yeah. uh, probably a well-to-do, perhaps businesswoman yeah. uh, in Corinth, sending her people. Who has these, people she can afford to send. That's right. Yeah. So freedmen or slaves yeah. uh, who've gone over to Ephesus yeah. and have brought uh, Paul some news. And apparently he's also received a letter from the Corinthians. Yeah. He refers in chapter 7 to uh, what they what have written wrote. to yeah. him about. And so they've posed to him some questions. And so Paul is probably piecing together from these questions and these reports some sense of, of the overall shape of the community at this time and probably making some connections between some of the things that they're asking him about and some of the reports that he's heard and then uh, offering a different vision. Yeah. So. Well, both. I just want to hold up both those things for a minute. Part of the fun of 1 Corinthians for me, and one of the reasons I love to teach it is that through these stuff from Chloe's people and through the letter, we get a closer, we don't get a full picture of how it felt to be a Corinthian, but we get closer because we get, we get glimpses, echoes of what they've actually said to him. That's unique in 1 Corinthians. And I think that the second thing is a totally unanswerable, puzzling question. Where might the Corinthians be right? I mean, where do they have a point? 
because this is scripture, of course, and they're not, right? Chloe's people report's not scripture. We don't have the letter, and this is the blessed St. Paul, so he must have it right at all times. I suspect that was much more unclear for the Corinthians. Mm -hmm. um, they had their opinions, he had his opinion. Apollos may have had slightly different opinions. And one other thing that I think we need to throw into the mix, some of the problems that are being generated in Corinth are coming from Paul's own teaching. Absolutely. And we'll see Absolutely. that in a little later on. That, he in, that they interpret him and perhaps misinterpret him, so that part of what he has to do is go back and say, I didn't mean by that what you think I meant by that because you're drawing the wrong implications of it. But see, let me try this on you. It seems to me that part of his worry is, and, and that we'll see a version of this all the way through, that they, they have rightly heard that life in Christ is brand new life. And they have perhaps wrongly interpreted that to mean anything goes. That's a slight exaggeration, but that now that we're in this new post-Jesus experience, new creation, Let's just rethink all the kinds of grounds by which we've gotten along with our society and along with our neighbors. And part of what I think he, part of what I think he's trying to do is kind of rein them in. I mean, if in Galatians he's trying to make Christians freer, in First Corinthians he's trying to make Christians more responsible. I and think that, that's, that's part of what happened in this letter. I think that's right on, and we'll uh, watch how he does that. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm.